Thank you all for coming. Um, and thanks for indulging me with my, with my kind of glorified hobby. Um, it's nice to be able to share it with so many people and so many wonderful people. So thanks for coming. I know you all could have chosen to do many, many things this evening. And it's really lovely to have you all here. This is the first time we are doing this at home. Um, as things happened, uh, in the summer, the loft is just too hot. And uh, Judith was, happened to be in town, and this, this happened. So, um, so that's why we're doing it here. But this is great. This evening wouldn't have been possible without, before, without Azar, uh, who is a friend of Judith's from their time at UBC, um, doing their doctoral work together. Um, so Azar, thanks for making this happen. And uh, to the PMS, to the Pune Music Society, Jangar and Binaifar, who very kindly have been hosting um, Judith for the last few days in Pune. And um, that's why we've been also, ha so thanks, many thanks to them. Uh, Azar is also going to be moderating the Q&A uh, after this. Azar is a, not only a long-term friend of mine, uh, trained in art and architecture, in the history of art and architecture, uh, social anth anthropology and planning. And he's been teaching urban planning for many years. Uh, Judith, thanks for coming. Uh, for those of you who uh, attended Judith, Judith's concert earlier this week, um, I don't think uh, that would, I don't think a longer introduction would be needed. Uh, but I'd like to say that it's very rare that we have um, someone who's a world-class performer, artist, um, as well as someone who's a scholar sharing their work with us. So that doesn't happen very often. Um, that's a really rare combination, and we're um, honored and really glad to have you. Um, very quickly, Judith Valerie Engel is an Austrian concert pianist and musicologist. She's currently pursuing a DPhil in historical musicology at the University of Oxford. She's also in the midst of doing a doctor doctorate of musical arts, a DMA, in piano performance at UBC in Vancouver. She's currently on leave from there. Very, very briefly, Judith started playing the piano at the age of five, has performed all over the world, has won international competitions. So, Judith, thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you, everyone, for making your way here. Thank you, Kushru and Anu, for, for hosting us. Uh, I'm so, so glad to be here. And also thank you, Azar, for your help. Binaifer and Jehangir, um, and uh, Rustam Vakil, who couldn't be here today. You have been amazing and so kind in bringing me here and uh, taking such good care of me. Thank you so much. I, I think. I want to give you a round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> so for, for those of you who came to one of my lecture recitals this uh, week, mm -hmm. uh, you uh, probably already know by now that I'm doing uh, my doctoral thesis on Mariana Martinez, the Viennese composer at the University of Oxford. Um, so when, uh, when we started talking about tonight's event uh, with Kushru and Aza, they, they first asked me if they should try to uh, put together an audience of musicologists for me to talk to. But actually, what I'm much more excited about is to talk to such a uh, broad variety of individuals. Every one of you has uh, such different individual experiences, skill sets, knowledge. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to non-musicologists. That doesn't mean if any of you do musicology that I <laughs> am not happy that you're here. <laughs> but uh, what I would like for this to be is just an opportunity maybe for all of us to engage with my research. And uh, all I ask of you is that you let your curiosity run free tonight and uh, be open to perhaps learning something interesting uh, engaging with different ideas. So, Mariana Martinez is, is quite a fascinating figure because during the 18th century, the musical scene in Europe was acutely missing its male protagonists, or so we think today. But actually too often scholars have assumed that composers and performers of instrumental music 
in uh, Mozart's Vienna were exclusively or predominantly men. But in presenting evidence today about a female composer and performer, I would like to challenge that notion um, of classical, Western classical music being a male domain, specifically tonight um, reclaiming some of this territory for women by speaking about Mariana Martinez, who was both a composer and a performer and highly successful at that. We shall look at some of the, extenuous, the extenuating circumstances that uh, made it possible for Martinez to pursue music successfully throughout her life, as well as looking at some of the historiographic aspects that allow us a more general consideration about how we deal with women in history and how we talk about women both historic and in the present day, really. Maybe a few words about how I myself came across Mariana Martinez. Even before studying my doctoral work at Oxford, I had engaged with her as a performer. I occupied myself with Martinez's music um, and I, in fact, played the first Salzburg performance of her piano concerto in A major in 2014 and got familiar with several other of her pieces. My own position and background continues to uh, play a, quite a major role in how I approach my research as well. And it necessitates a deep engagement with the question of what I individually can bring to the table in my own double role as a performer and researcher. Even though I first came in touch with Martinez as a performer tonight, I will not exclusively speak about her music, but rather situate her music as part of a larger picture, um, as an expression maybe of who Martinez was, or um, anyway, as far as we can reconstruct her identity, as far as we can trace her identity. Other sources that I will touch upon are letters by and to Martinez, some documents pertaining to her family life and the living situation of the family, as well as to portraits that are associated with Martinez and some other aspects that help situate her within the broader socio-political socio context of 18th century Vienna. Uh, to, start, to start us off, I will give uh, some basic biographic details. Um, for a more in-depth study of her biography, I can highly recommend this excellently researched book by Irving Gott and John Rice. Um, it's called Mariana Martinez, a woman composer in the Vienna of Mozart and Haydn. So Martinez was born in 1744 in Vienna, her parents were Niccolo Martinez, a, initially a soldier from Naples, descendant of an old Spanish family, hence the name Martinez. And he eventually gave up his military career, got married to a German woman, Maria Theresia. Her maiden name is unfortunately unknown. And the couple eventually settled in Vienna in uh, or around 1729. Here, Niccolo became master of ceremony for the papal nuncio, so quite an esteemed position. And they had numerous children, of which six survived into adulthood. Mariana is the second one of those surviving children. Her siblings were Joseph, who had a stellar career in the imperial court library. Uh, Dionysus Karl, who had a career in mining. Johann Baptiste, who attended an engineering academy and eventually chose a career in military, the only sister, Antonia, and the youngest brother, Karl Borromeus. In uh, 1774, then, interestingly, the uh, four brothers were elevated into nobility. They were knighted, so to say. Uh, in German, it's called the Ritterstand that they now belong to. And as a result, the two sisters now also belonged to Austrian aristocracy. Should, should I wait for our new guests to arrive? Okay. Continue? Okay. Um, 
So Mariana Martinez was notably close to her family, uh, except for one, none of the Martinez siblings actually got married, and the oldest brother Joseph and the two sisters, Mariana and Antonia, lived together throughout their lives. Um, Joseph, as I mentioned, had a very successful career in the court library, and in fact, at the age of 20, he had already mastered 12 languages, uh, next to the more common ones like uh, German, French, Italian, English, Spanish. He also knew Latin, Greek, Hebrew, Arabic, Syriac, Persian, and Turkish. <laughs> so thereby, he called the Imperial Code Library's attention upon himself and was soon uh, made assistant for Oriental languages there and eventually uh, he was promoted even to the director of the library. In addition, he also taught some of the children of the Habsburg emperors, among others, the future leader of the country, Joseph II. After the brother Joseph Martinez had passed away, it was just the two sisters left, Mariana and Antonia. And unfortunately, we don't really know a lot about Antonia, except for her close relationship with her sister, Mariana. They both died in 1812, within a day of each other. Now that we know who the, fam uh, the Martinez family were, let us look at where they were staying. Because, and I did not just include that because we're in an architect's house, um, it was actually rather significant for Mariana Martinez's development as a musician, this Michaela house. This Michaela house is the building next to St. Michael's Church in the city center of Vienna and the Martinez family moved there sometime around 1735. At that time, there was a hierarchy inherent in the placement of one's apartment within a building. So depending on which story a family lived in, people could deduct their social standing and the writer Johann Petzl, uh, an 18th century Austrian writer, actually described this in one of his books, Skizzen von Wien. He wrote, the ground floor of almost all houses in Vienna is not lived in, but serves as a space for shops, taverns, stables, workshops, storage places, apothecaries, coffee houses, etc. The first floor, although enjoying the advantage of being reached by only one flight of stairs, is not considered the best part of the house because the rooms are hard to heat on account of the vaulted ground floor below. Also, because they are affected by the dust from the street, the smells of stables and sewers and the noise of wheeled vehicles passing outside or entering and leaving the house. Furthermore, in the narrower streets, these apartments receive the least daylight and are more expensive in terms of lighting costs. The second floor is considered the most comfortable, hence the dearest. On this basis, rent payments decrease the higher one mounts. The more stairs you climb, the cheaper it gets. The better the air and the finer the views, but it is hard work carrying the necessities of life, wood, water, etc., to these heavenly heights. And while the number of steps brings a reduction in rent, it increases the price to be paid for delivery of goods carried up 150 steps 10 times a day. So the, the dearest one, the second floor of the Michaela house was occupied by the Dowager Princess of Esterhazy. She was the mother of, uh, so her two sons were the future employers of Josef Haydn, who happened to live, at least for a while, in one of the cheap attic rooms of that same building, after having been kicked out of the boys' choir of St. Stephen's Cathedral. The third floor was where the Martinez family lived. And they, interestingly enough, shared an apartment with Pietro Metastasio. Now, Metastasio was the most influential librettist of the 18th century. There is probably no one else whose texts have been set to music as much as his. Metastasio had been summoned to Vienna by Habsburg Emperor Charles VI, who had appointed him imperial court poet in 1730. So Metastasio was, without a doubt, 
the most important and influential figure in uh, Martinez's development. Nicola Martinez, the father, presumably knew Metastasio from before either of them had moved to Vienna, which would explain why they decided to settle in the same household. And Metastasio took on a paternal role, especially after Nicolo had passed away. Next to Haydn's stint in the Michaela house, there was also Nicola Porpora, um, who spent several years in uh, the building. With both of them, Martinez had regular lessons. Haydn gave her piano lessons, and Porpora gave her composition and singing lessons. And the latter were apparently accompanied by Haydn on the piano. And lastly, further composition uh, instruction came from Giuseppe Bono. He's the only one who was not actually an immediate neighbor. One of the many honors that Martinez received was being admitted to the Accademia Filarmonica di Bologna. So becoming a member of this academy was the highest honor that could be bestowed upon a composer at the time. Martinez, notably, was the first woman to ever be admitted to the Academia. Presumably, it was Metastasio's connections that helped achieve this. He drew the Academy's attention, and specifically Padre Martini of the uh, Academy, to Martinez's work. The Italian priest, Padre Martini, was apparently quite taken with Martinez's compositions, there is a reference to this in one of Metastasio's letters, oh, we're here, um, where he writes, the young female composer who sent you some specimens of her studies was only ambitious for your corrections and advice, but you have been pleased to honor her with your approbation and praise. So some of you will have heard me play the uh, G major sonata by Martinez two days ago, or maybe even uh, back in Mumbai. For those of you who didn't, I cannot in good conscience let you leave here today without having made sure that you actually heard some of Martinez's music. So we will listen to two short excerpts of uh, live recordings that I did. The uh, first one is an excerpt of Martinez's piano concerto in A major, here a performance from Salzburg. Unfortunately, not the first Salzburg performance because that one sadly was not recorded. <laughs> uh, let me just quickly switch to YouTube. So here an excerpt of the first movement, the Allegro con Spirito. The second 
example that I would like to play for you is from actually from the G major sonata. Uh, it's the second movement, the Andante, and this is a beautiful example of her simple cantabile style. And uh, here in this movement, she wrote out all her embellishments, which is not always the case. But of course, tasteful embellishments, whether written down or improvised, are always an essential part of this kind of music. Um, let's see. Always trying to end on a cadence. <laughs> so I hope this gave you a little taste of her music. She also wrote uh, a bunch of large orchestral works, several oratorios, cantatas, etc. But being a pianist, I'm obviously very interested in her piano music. Oh uh, yeah, here the uh, Andante from the G major sonata, and uh, we can see all the dense black notes in the right hand, those are the embellishments that she uh, decided to write out in this movement. So in my research, some of the most uh, interesting and revealing sources have actually been non-academic texts, specifically the forewords of uh, music editions and uh, program notes. Uh, they are important because for Western classical music, they are actually the uh, most widespread method of information dissemination um, uh, regarding the repertoire, because among musicians and audiences alike, the vast majority will never read an academic uh, article. Yet, by reading program notes, which are often based on the forewords and the prefaces of music editions, people do their research and tend to blindly trust whatever is written there. So earlier this year, the Royal Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra performed Mozart's Requiem. And in the first half, they played Haydn's 49th Symphony and a cantata by Mariana Martinez. On their website, they briefly introduced Martinez by writing, the inspirational Corinna Niemeyer conducts an all-star lineup of singers and rediscovers emotionally charged 18th century masterpieces by two of Mozart's greatest friends, Joseph Haydn and the brilliant, unfairly neglected composer Mariana Martinez, whose family even helped out a young Haydn by letting him lodge in their attic. I will let you decide for yourselves if we really should call Haydn one of Mozart's greatest friends. The Martinez and the Mozart family, they knew each other and according to Michael Kelly, Wolfgang and Mariana even performed together. He reported that Wolfgang was an almost constant attendant at her parties and I've heard him play duets on the pianoforte with her of his own composition. She was a great favorite of his. Still, I would be careful labeling them 18th century besties. Uh, the last line, of the quote uh, on the website is actually what uh, I find most misleading. Because while it is true that Haydn for a while lived in the attic of the Michaela house, I have yet to see proof that the house 
belonged to the Martinez family. By that logic, the family would have also lent a helping hand to the Dowager Princess of Esterhazy, who lived on the floor below them. There is this tendency to try and make Martinez more interesting somehow. It is unfortunately a common trend. While occasionally entertaining, I find it mostly frustrating because it is unnecessary. Martinez is already interesting enough, actually even more interesting in my opinion, without these fabulations. A common practice is to try and fashion Martinez into a kind of feminist role model with a very narrow definition of what that is. As an example, the preface to the Furore edition of the keyboard concerto in A major reads, after Metastasio's death, in 1782, Mariana inherited a significant capital that she partially used to host artistic musical soirees in her home. She performed as a singer and pianist, even in forehand pieces together with Mozart. These weekly musical evenings played an important role in the artistic life of Vienna. In the years post-1790, she also invested in her own singing school in order to help encourage young women to study music. A second example uh, in the preface to the Edition Donna of her keyboard sonatas in E and A major reads uh, in 1783, it's actually 82, but never mind. Her fatherly benefactor Metastasio died and left her his entire fortune that enabled her to open up her own singing school for young girls in Vienna. The fact that the graduates would lose their jobs in ecclesiastic spaces due to the verdict mulier tatiat in Ecclesia shall not be discussed further here. Again, mulier in Ecclesia tatiat uh, means uh, women uh, are quiet in church. I will, I will expand on it a bit. <laughs> so here again we see uh, these biographical facts conflated with invention and imprecision. So Metastasio, who spent his Viennese uh, years sharing the apartment with the Martinez family, did in fact uh, leave his fortune to them, as is well documented. From uh, Metastasio's own testament, we know um, a little more uh, nuanced uh, the instructions that he left. Uh, um, he left 20,000 florins each to Mariana and Antonia, but made Joseph, the oldest brother, his sole heir. And he justified this by saying that the other brothers were already we well on their way to having a good career and didn't need his support. So, but aside from these l minor inaccuracies regarding the inheritance, what bothers me about this quote is the final sentence where they claim that Martinez opened a singing school in order to help encourage young women to study music. This is, of course, a very attractive idea, but as of yet, I've not come across, I don't know, Martinez's feminist manifesto of enlightenment sisterhood. There is no proof of her motivation for opening the singing school, only that she opened one. On a side note, I also feel that their feminist agenda is slightly undermined by the fact that they insist on referring to Martinez by her first name, Mariana, while all the male protagonists are referred to last name only. Similarly, the Edition Donna quote associates the singing school with this uh, rather misogynistic historic Christian practice that forbade women to sing in church, or at all. Uh, however, Mulia in Ecclesia Tatiat is actually strongly associated with Pope Clement IX, and that was 100 years before Martinez. And uh, then also with uh, some other Catholics in the 19th century, but again, not Martinez's time. And anyway, Austria was actually notoriously bad in following the, these rules from the Vatican. So it really didn't affect, it wouldn't have affected Martinez's students. Um, but yet, Edition Donner decided to put it into their preface. And in a way, it creates this forcefully, uh, yeah, this forcefully created feminist-ish narrative around Martinez um, that is actually rather misleading and not connected to, uh, to the historical uh, 
facts. Yeah, it is, it is this attempt to uh, embed Martinez, her life and work into a larger feminist discourse, but it does so unconvincingly. While I continue to uh, um, be uncomfortable with this idea of fashioning Martinez into a feminist role model, I do believe that it is useful to look at her through a feminist lens. The difference being that I, as a feminist, can look at Martinez, but I cannot, in good academic conscience, look at Martinez as a feminist. <laughs> One of the biggest challenges has probably been finding appropriate language to discuss these issues and to use a feminist lens to understand the uh, remarkable achievements of Martinez while also respecting the integrity of her as a historical figure. Not unlike actually analyzing a musical score or interpreting a piece of music, I feel I need to query repeatedly what questions I can actually ask of the archive, which in itself cannot be accepted as unquestioned fact, but needs to be seen as a site of knowledge production because it exposes hierarchical orderings and power knowledge relationships, especially pertaining to social strata and gender dynamics. And the, the differentiation is crucial for aspects that probably made up the most central parts of Martinez's person and character are for the most part not relayed in the archive and they differ from the dominant narratives that are in the archive. So these dominant narratives that have emerged center around the ruling house of Habsburg and the relationship to the prominent Metastasio. Uh, then also the Martinez's ascension into Austrian nobility, Martinez's admittance to the Academia Philharmonica di Bologna, which itself though was also partly due to the support of Empress Maria Theresia. And uh, perhaps Martinez's salons and academies are mentioned. And of course, centrally also the familiarity with the Mozarts, although here, of course, Martinez only appears as a side character in someone else's story. Even the one, perhaps two, existing portraits of Martinez play into these narratives. The inscription on the portrait confirms that this is, in fact, Mariana Martinez, uh, and it is attributed to the painter Anton von Maron. Yet, for various stylistic reasons, as well as discrepancies in the timeline, I actually question his authorship. Still, he continues to be cited as the artist, despite the fact that the painting is unsigned and the provenance is uh, rather intransparent. It is likely a portrait, uh, the portrait or a copy of the portrait that was made for the Academia in Bologna because it has this typical Italian Academy member style, the half-length portrait and the breastwork with the inscription. Uh, yet, despite the fact that Anton von Maron's uh, Academy portraits are distinctly different, he continues to be cited as the artist, most likely because he very neatly fits into the Habsburg narrative. He was the court poet for a while for Empress Maria Theresia and her son Joseph II. The other painting in my opinion, has yet to even be proven to be of Martinez. Other than the fact that it is a white lady playing the piano, nothing suggests that it is Martinez. Here too, the painter that it is attributed to, Peter Anton Lorenzoni, is most likely not the artist, especially if it actually is a portrait of Martinez, because Lorenzoni, as far as we know, never spent any significant time in Vienna, and Martinez never left Vienna. Yet, it is very convenient because Lorenzoni painted some members of the Mozart family and this way we can connect him to Martinez through this otherwise unidentified portrait. Whatever the master narratives most central to Mar who Martinez was were probably her family relationships due to the high social standing of her family and the somewhat unusual joint household with Metastasio, we do have a few um, documents uh, with information pertaining to her family life, 
for instance, we know that her, fam uh, her parents were, qui were quite ill relatively early on. When she was 14, her brother Joseph applied for a promotion in the court library saying he would have great need for the fruit of his efforts to support his poor family that is a disabled and frail father, a sick mother and four between his brothers and sisters all in need of his help. Metastasio, um, who uh, interestingly according to uh, one of the Martinez letters was also a bit of a hypochondriac, took on a paternal role after Niccolo, the father, died. And in his testament, Metastasio then wrote about the two sisters more in need of subsistence than uh, the other siblings and less able than the others by reasons of sex to honestly procure it. Fortune did not do them the least of its favors. So they have no other capital left than their irreprehensible morals and my due care to secure them as far as I can from painful poverty. Metastasio is of course referring to the fact that both sisters were unmarried. The only way to honestly procure subsistence for women of their social standing, I should add, would have been marriage. Um, working as a professional, especially as a professional musician, would have, deemed, would have been deemed improper for them. He uh, fails to mention that the three, three of the four Martinez brothers were also unmarried, but that apparently seemed like less of a tragedy to the old poet. <laughs> Martinez spent her uh, entire life really carefully avoiding transgressing too far into the public eye or assuming any kind of professional status, though her abilities were very much on par with that of professional performers and composers. This is a testament to the severe pressure that was placed upon her through her family and the uh, larger uh, social structures and her position in society. The significance of Mariana and Antonia's unmarried status needs to be understood in the context, in the broader historical context of Maria Theresia's empire and then that of her son Joseph II. The Habsburgs were notoriously famous for their marriage politics, not only because they strategically married off their children to other European rulers to create alliances. In fact, uh, Maria Theresia is said to have called her children her colonies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Austrian legislature was also very uh, strict and it was continuously updated to uh, further marriage and population growth. So that obviously included very strict abortion laws uh, under Austrian criminal law, which continue to be influential into present day Austria, and measures to facilitate marriage. For instance, the Empress uh, released this decree in 1766, urging to enable and encourage, pave the way for soldiers to get married. Uh, there were publications printed that neatly summed up all relevant laws um, for uh, pertaining to marriage and divorce. Even, uh, even those regulating interfaith marriages between Christians and Jews. And in terms of gender roles, it states that the husband is the head of the family. In this role, he has the right to run the household. However, he also has to, according to his abilities, procure the alimentation for his wife and has to represent her in all incidents. Martinez avoided all this instead of a husband, their wise older brother, as Metastasio put it, acted as the head of house. Yet we must assume that the Martinez sisters would have been at times under severe pressure to get married and would have been targeted by the usual othering that unmarried women experienced. Uh, one of the common tropes, even nowadays, is of course the infantilization of older unmarried women. And we find an example of this in an account of Michael Kelly when he reported uh, about a visit to one of Martinez's salons. He wrote, when I was admitted to her conversation and musical parties, she was in the veil of years, yet still possessed the gaiety and vivacity of a girl and was polite and affable to all. Martinez, <laughs> Martinez herself demonstrates, 
definitive awareness of gender differences, most poignantly in this letter where she re directly refers to the weakness of her sex. Um, this letter is to Padre Martini. Of course, this was also very deliberately put there because it was part of gallant letter writing and polite social interaction, especially for someone who prided herself in having translated De la Casa's Galateo from Italian to French. This was a kind of 16th century guide to a polite social interaction. So Martinez is a really fascinating woman. Uh, to me anyway, and I hope I've, uh, I've sparked your interest in her as well. And I think uh, she needs to be explored through a f an intersectional feminist lens because feminists and queer theories have given us these powerful tools of discernment of nuances that would otherwise be overlooked among the dominant narratives. And I think it will be impossible to avoid Martinez being hoisted into some kind of role model status, um, for there were simply not enough women around, or at least not enough that we really know anything about. However, I want to caution against sort of whitewashing her with a misguided feminist agenda, but rather use a highly individualized intersectional approach in an honest attempt to understand aspects of who she was and uh, accept her exemplary status as highly personalized and just unique to her situation. On the other hand, it would also be wrong to dismiss her as an insignificant woman. Um, the other side of the coin is that uh, oftentimes women who were not engaging in uh, outright revolutionary acts or were suffragettes themselves are belittled or deemed lesser, not worthy of being labeled strong or significant women simply because they do not fit this narrow understanding of what an empowered woman is supposed to be in our present day perspective. I argue that we need to appreciate the individual acts of empowerment that people engage in while navigating their specific life circumstances. One of my own aims is to make Martinez's life and music more well known, other than uh, writing my doctoral dissertation and playing her music in concert. I also want to uh, publish proper editions for her music because the existing ones are ripe with typos and barely usable, to be honest. And the other thing that is quite important in uh, spreading her music is uh, having reference recordings. Unfortunately, here too, um, a lot of barriers spring up, for despite Martinez's relatively unknown status, the fact that there now is a little bit of engagement with her um, seems to very, convincing, uh, very conveniently serve as an excuse uh, to not pull any resources into her. Um, as an example, a funding body I applied to to produce um, uh, editions and professional standard videos of her complete piano works. Um, uh, the uh, application was denied with the reason that she's already better known now. So we uh, don't feel it is necessary to fund this project. Yet for some reason people don't have any qualms about producing yet another Mozart complete recording CD set. To be honest, I'm also not sure how more well known is defined um, because even at the Oxford Music Faculty I met many people who until they met me had not heard of Martinez. Anyway, this shall not deter us. For now, if you are interested in listening some, to some more of her music, I do have a few videos on YouTube and uh, you're obviously more than welcome to search for them. I think we have time for a few questions. <laughs> Thank you so much.